this is this is the path I, I want to take. So they yeah they offered me the job and I took it and yeah so I started on the first of September '97 as a game set a rare keeper slide, <laughs> and that was my first game that hey. I, I tested. Um, Diddy Come Racing. So this um, this hadn't been announced at that time, and the day I started was the day before these the testers started crunching testing that game. So I almost didn't go back on day two. I thought, what the hell is this? This is a right baptism of fire. Um, but anyway, I stuck it out, and it was six weeks of sort of fairly late nights testing that, and it got um, released, I think, November '97, and did quite well. Um, and then when that was out of the way, this one came into testing, Banjo Kazooie, which was a sort of 3D platform game, heavily inspired by Super Mario 64, which had come out uh, the year. Be uh, no, when did that come out? '96. That's right. It was a launch title for the N64. Um, so yes, yeah, so I spent uh, quite a few months testing this. Bills would come in to testing, uh, and then, then when when we had nothing to test, you could kind of pretty much play anything you wanted. So I think I finished Final Fantasy VII purely in work time, sort of about 100 hours. <laughs> Times have changed. Yeah, yeah. You can't yeah. get away with that anymore. Yeah. That's so idea, yeah. Um, where am I going with this? Well. <laughs> oh yeah. So yeah, you have a sip of cider. So. Um, this is the most informal thing that's ever happened on a rocket jump, right? I'm so sorry. We did a pint. Oh my god. So anyway, during during um, testing time of, of uh, Banjo Kazooie, it eventually got released. Yeah, summer of '98. There you go. Um, and I remember that there's a guy called Greg Mails who is uh, he's still the design director at Rare. Actually, he was the the lead designer on Banjo Kazooie and then the head, the team leader, very close to the Stampers, who are obviously the founders of Rare. And then after we after we finished testing that, he sent like a this little task for all the testers, like, oh, if we were to do a, a, a sequel to Banjo Kazooie, you know, what 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 would you change? You know, what didn't you like about the game? What would you improve? You know, any new moves that the characters would have, that kind of thing. And I thought, eh, maybe there's something in this. So anyway, I did this like two page document of like things that I liked, things I didn't like, you know, things I would change, that kind of thing. And then sort of forgot about it for a few weeks, and then. Long story short, yeah, I got the call out to the boardroom and the, the Snapper brother said, oh, Greg would like you to go on to ban the Banjo team and be his like assistant designer. Because there were only two designers on that game, uh, Greg being the lead designer, and the other designer then moved on to what became Donkey Kong 64, I think. So I sort of went, moved over then to fill his shoes, yeah. It's a valuable lesson within the games industry, I think, that we, like so many of us, started in test and haven't ended up remaining in test. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like it's a really harsh thing to say, don't turn something down just because it's not for you. I mean, obviously, if it's cleaning toilets at a games company, then turn it down. But like, <laughs> just like testing is a really good way to get into the industry. Yeah. And I think a lot of people overlook it. Yeah, yeah. Don't get me wrong. I'm not putting that you know, avenue down whatsoever. I just knew kind of it yeah, wasn't it really wasn't for me long yeah, term. Yeah, yeah. So I know guys that like, there was one guy there who's still there in testing at Red. Yeah. And it was, really he it. never wanted to move. It's like Dave, do you want know, Dave Wong, his name is, um, is credited on both these games. And uh, I always ask him, do you, do you know what I get into design? And, no, this is like my perfect job. You know, he just had that mentality of because yeah. when you were doing this, you know, all my all workmates that ask you, oh, what are you doing now? And you tell them, oh, you play computer games for a living. Like, no, I play the same game over yeah, and over again, <laughs> trying to break it. Yeah, five weeks. And it, it, it was fine. I, I always liked just taking it and like trying to suggest ways I could improve it. I didn't like just running against the, the background to try and fall out the map. You know, that drove me mad. It wasn't for me. You know, so I knew I could only sort of contribute yeah. so much to that kind of thing. Um, so anyway. So this became the sequel to Banjo Kazooie. Imaginatively titled Banjo Tooie. <laughs> Doesn't really make sense, but anyway. Um, yeah, so um, next one. Here we go. So anyway, partway through um, so this took this when we started, I moved on the team summer ninety-eight. And eventually came out summer two thousand. It was originally meant to come out at the end of ninety-nine. And of course, as Lauren said, you know, we were making games for Nintendo. At that time, Nintendo owned 49% of Rare. A lot of people don't really appreciate that. Um, but they were like, well, we need more time. And they were like, yeah, that's fine. Just make the game you want to make. And even in the end, actually, one of the levels got cut. And there was like, there is a finished design like this for the final level, which never saw the light of day. I'm not sure. Did you draw these? 
No, so, well, this is the first, this is the first level I had at Stabat designing, which is the factory level, it became known as Grunty Industries. Um, so I kind of tried to push myself as, as much as I could, really, and it ended up being pretty complex. It was like a multi-tiered affair. Um, so then I handed this, 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 this map, this poorly sort of drawn map, to Greg on a bit of paper, and then he saw, oh, no, this, is, this is really good, you know, for a first attempt. <laughs> Um, and then he sort of redrew it then in his style and then would pass it on to the rest of the team. Because you've got to remember, like back then, there were no sort of design tools. You, know, you, never, you, know, you didn't have like Unity and Unreal like you have now where you can you know, quickly sort of build stuff yourself. It was all done on paper. And then these would be given to like a, a you know, graphics artist to mock up. And then the programmers would like literally hard code everything. You know, there was no scripting back then. Like, if you were lucky, you'd have like a, a really primitive in-game editor that you'd use an N64 pad to sort of put you know things down in the game. We did that with, between us for two. Um, but yeah, um, it was mostly sort of you, you would just sit there with a code or a background artist and sort of you know do that, do that, make that sort of change. Let's try this, that kind of thing, and just sort of go from there. Um, oh yeah, these are just I robbed these. On the internet. These are from like some some uh, Brady Games guide, I think. So that's that's what ended up being a map of all the levels of that level. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. No, it is quite intricate. Yeah, because what you got to remember was that the process back then was like, well, we got this this world for this game. You know, there are ten jigsaw pieces. You know, the player's got to perform ten tasks to sort of earn them, and you know, go away for two weeks and think of puzzle ideas, that kind of thing, and then spend another two weeks sort of drawing a map, you know, eventually you come back with a finished design that would hopefully make sense. And then the next level, I, I sort of did half of that. It's like a fire and ice world, I think I did the icy side and Greg did the, the fiery side, and then there the, were sort of the two, two halves of a, of a level. Uh, then this was the final level in the game. This was I pretty much did on my own again. That one, Cloud Cuckoo Land, the weird. And these are all the sort of bosses that were in the game. And that top, this top one here, actually, this was like a sort of welding torch in the factory level. And that, how that came about was it was um, I like just had an idea for like an enemy. It was like literally a welding torch with eyes. And I thought that's really shit. And they threw it in the bin. And then we were thinking of oh, what enemies would we have in this factory level? You know something. And I, I kind of got this bit of paper out of the bin and gave it to Greg. So, oh, you know, I drew this, and he, he looked at wiped the bit, of, you know, the water, whatever was on it. It was awesome. I've still got the bit of paper with water stains on it, actually. And um, he said, oh, that could be a really cool boss. And it ended up being like you know, one of the best bosses in the game. Um, so yeah, just goes to show, you know, no matter if you have a really shitty idea, just don't throw anything away. But someone might see something else in it and interpret it in a different way. I think that's good advice. Really yeah, <laughs> literally write ev everything down. Uh, yeah, just, just yeah, just write everything down and then yeah, give it to someone else and say it's shit in it. And hopefully they'll say, oh no, well it'd be a mostly shit, but that bit's quite good. Yeah. I'm sorry. That's all right. Do you carry on? Uh, yeah, let's go next. Then uh, that ended up being all the characters in the game. It's quite. I didn't realise there were that many. There were shit loads. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's bad, bad jokes too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bad jokes yeah, yeah. look so irrelevant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it was great. It was a lot, a lot of fun that game. Um, and we, yeah, we sort of write all the di cheesy dialogue. You know, you probably have like a proper writer these days to sort of write most of it. Um, a lot of innuendos. A lot of it was trying to get as many innuendos into the game without, you know, and trying. You know, hopefully that you know that innuendo when it got to the other side of the Atlantic would kind of be totally innocent and it'd be like yeah, <laughs> which you know, gladly was the case for most of it. Um, so yeah, so that like five years passed. Um, so th this project, it kind of went through, it's kind of like an old time, well for me personally, it's rare, because it started off as like a remake of the first Banjo-Kazooie game, it was going to be for the, for the Xbox 360, but it was going to be remade as like a multiplayer, four player game, and that soon kind of got canned, and then changed direction to something else, and that also got canned, and then became, it became... <sighs> Well, so the Stampers had the idea for this, the idea of like finding blocks and building your own vehicles, that kind of thing. Yeah. Kind of like Minecraft for, you know, 
before they stole the idea off us. Have I mocked you for that before? Is that why you're being really sheepish with it? I'm sorry. Um, I'm the worst friend. But, any, but anyway, so they had this concept of, you know, we, we, proved, we spent ages developing this, this sort of UI where you could stitch all these blocks together and build vehicles and they would actually behave, you know, real physics and how you would expect them to behave. Um, and then someone had the idea of, oh, we'll make that a banjo game. So, of course, uh, it, it then became this, Banjo Kazooie Nuts and Bolts, which kind of split, um, again, fans, because real died in the wall fans, you know, were expecting Banjo Kazooie 3, they didn't get it. And, of course, the, the sort of other people were like, oh, it's great, they're trying something different. You know, you, again, you can't please everybody all the time. Yeah. Well, um, it was a, a departure, I guess. It was just added new elements yeah. to it. I guess finally, it's Banjo Three has kind of been made by Platonic, oh, yeah. <laughs> as a ukulele. I mean, yeah, we saw it at, at EGX, right? And it's it is basically Banjo Kazooie Three, which is exactly what people paid two million for as a Kickstarter. So that's great. That's looking amazing. We should all absolutely support that because Microsoft are letting them do it. Like that's that's such I'm a, a huge yeah. deal. No, I'm amazed. I'm amazed. It's so blatant. I'm amazed that yeah, they yeah. Microsoft haven't got no. You're not doing that, but you know, good for them. For, absolutely. You know, yeah, it looks great. Yeah, in the name of, you know, art, I sure. suppose. Um, uh, all right, so this on this game, um, it was like a hub town uh, called Showdown Town, and I was given the, the, the task of designing, designing this because it, it was the part of the game that was most like the previous Banjo game. So this is like my initial map, which is when, when was that from? 2008. That was 2007. No, they're both 2007. Oh. Yeah, that's when I drew the map. The game's the map in 2008. Right, there you go. Yeah, so that's, again, like, like, as I said, you know, everything was drawn on paper, you know, back then, and then that was given to, like, a background artist, and they would, they would just model it, in, you know, directly in Maya, you know. And I spent ages just sit, sitting with, um, with the artist, just trying to figure out the scale, you know, dropping a character into the world, just making sure everyone could was the right, the right sort of scale. I mean, obviously, it's a lot easier to do that now with like Unity and Unreal. You can just kind of do it yourself, even if you're not particularly technical. It's quite easy to do. If I can do it, anybody can do it. Um, just the yeah. So there's that, and uh, that's the kind of finished map. And the, yeah, these are some, I just found these on an old flash drive. These are some screenshots that I took at the time from the the in-game editor of the world sort of being built up. Yeah, not particularly pretty there. But then it, this is the final thing. Um, so these are some screenshots. Yeah. And again, uh, and this this is um, I completely forgotten about this. So the, this is one of the actual game levels. Uh, so they were all all, all the levels in, in this game were all set in sort of called game globes. So everything was like in a sphere, which is why they're all you know, circular. Um, and this this level we, we, this was the last level to be designed. And as we were up against it time wise, we had to kind of cut it. And I completely forgot that I designed this until. Greg tweeted tweeted it last year on the back of Rare Replay. I was like, oh shit, but you forgot about that level. Uh, but I, again, I found this on that same flash drive. So this, I, this is the first time I've ever actually shown this to anybody um, outside of Rare. Um, she was okay to do so. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. But I suppose, um, so yeah, again, starting on paper. Um, and there's like a this one here is just to show you know where the, which way the um, the slopes are, are going. And there would, be, there would always be as well, instead of like a plan view, there'd always be like some isometric sketches of like little areas to kind of try and show. I mean, I'm not, you know, an artist, but I get the idea. Of, you just, you're just got to get the art, idea across. No, I mean, this, what, you, what you can't see here is the original bit of paper, which is, you know, done in pencil, and it's practically, you know, you can see through it because it's been like rubbed out so many times. You, know, it's, you don't just draw this first time. This is just, you know, a finished project, a uh, finished thing gone over in... Marker. Um, right. I know that's just that annotated, just saying what everything is. Yeah, it's quite cool, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's a railroad going through it. Never mind. Oh well. All right.